Welcome, everybody. Uh, today is the uh, 15th of April, uh, 2012, and we're here celebrating the 45th anniversary of the bike lanes in Davis. And uh, my name is Bob Bowen. I'm the public relations manager for the city of Davis. And uh, uh, I've been fortunate enough to work with both of these gentlemen uh, working with the city. Uh, first time I started working for the city was back in uh, the late 60s. But uh, these guys have a lot of uh, experience, and you'll hear some of that today. Uh, Maynard Skinner uh, was first elected in 1966. And uh, he was elected four times. He ran five, but he was only elected four times. And uh, we were just figuring out if that was the most of any city council member, but apparently uh, Calvin Koval got him. Calvin was elected six times in the city of Davis. I'm gonna make him come back. You're gonna be, he's gonna come back. <laughs> So, uh, as Maynard will remind you, he has served in four decades, the 60s, the 70s, 80s, and part of the 90s, and he keeps threatening to come back in the 2000s. So, I wouldn't put it past him, and uh, we're really fortunate because a week ago Monday, he had a hip replacement. So, he uh, walked over here today from his house over on University Avenue to be part of this. You know, when you have a crowd and a microphone, you can't keep politicians away. <laughs> So Maynard was elected in 1966, again in 1970, uh, and then he took a little break. He tried to run in 78, and that didn't work out so well, but he came back in 88 and in 92 and uh, served on the council with a, a whole lot of folks over the years. So he's seen really the development of the infrastructure in Davis. Um, and he'll tell you the story about Davis, the political uh, background of him getting his first uh, uh, run at city council and then uh, some of the direction that those city councils provided to the Public Works uh, Department. And we we're fortunate to have Dave Peltz, who served uh, for 37 years with the city of Davis and retired in 1999, 99. Uh, after 37 years, and when, when we were going through at the retirement ceremony, you know, we had the belt buckles and the pins and the, and the uh, uh, lapel pins, and then we created this page that says, oh, why don't you pick out that? And he goes, what? And he goes, well, there's, there's an overcrossing. Why don't, we, why don't you get that for your retirement <laughs> gift? <laughs> so now I have the Dave Peltz bike and pedestrian overcrossing. So um, this is a little bit overkill for this room, I understand it, but uh, with the microphones, we'll be able to get whatever is said on videotape. So that's why we're making it. And then later on, when you have questions, we'll have them repeat the questions so that they'll go on to the, reti uh, the recording. And then we can also put this on Davis Media Access and Government Channel in the future. So uh, I'd like to introduce you to, and we'll start with Maynard, kind of setting the scene back in 1965, 66, what was going on in Davis. And then uh, after he gets elected and starts making reasonable and unreasonable demands of the public Works Department, then Public Works Department and Dave will, will kick in with his story. So please welcome Maynard and Dave. Well, well thank you. Um, this is my high wheeler. I, I live a block over here. <laughs> I would have biked over, but uh, this wouldn't fit on the back. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> 45 years ago, uh, there might be a few uh, minor embellishments in the thing that I, things that I say here today, but basically uh, it's been researched. Uh, Ken has a master's thesis on it and other, other letters, uh, other uh, uh, documents that pretty well spelled out what's happened early on and during the course of that. So uh, let me set the stage. Uh, I'm going to read this because I, I didn't know whether I'd be here or not. <coughs> Here. So I, I uh, wrote this out, and so I'm just going to read it to you. That's good, because I'll, I'll stay on task <laughs> and, and uh, won't talk too much. So let's set the stage for the 1966 election. I moved here in the early 60s, and it was amazing to find in, in Davis a university community very similar to where I lived uh, in Boulder, Colorado, the University of Colorado. It was just pretty much like it was at the University of Colorado Boulder in 1930s, uh, kind of a sleepy little town with a university-dominated uh, community. The city councils of the of Davis 50s and 60s were dominated uh, by the downtown interests. And there were, as I recall, there were only two university-related people, uh, Vern Hickey, the the director of athletics, and uh, Katie Green, who was the first uh, woman to serve on the Davis City Council and wife of a university professor. <clears throat> uh, those city councils uh, 
concern themselves mostly with the physical aspects of uh, making the city run, such as uh, repairing the roads and the streets, uh, making sure we had adequate water, public safety, police and fire, and were adequately staffed. And of course, we did have some recreational programs. The main concerns were making sure the infrastructure worked. Okay, fast forward to 1966. Two uh, previous uh, city, uh, two previous keep, two previous council people that were. Uh, hmm. uh, I, I missed. I mistyped that. <laughs> just, a, just a little bit. Anyway, uh, I was somewhat out of the the mold, uh, you might say, and you would perhaps use the term progressive. Uh, uh, Norm Woodbury, who was on the Davis City Council, uh, he was a legislative advocate, advocate for the organization of uh, the California City's power, it's public power, you know, like uh, SPUD and uh, Roseville. And Kent Gill, who was a teacher in school, that's who the two I was referring to previously, Kent Gill, uh, who was very active in the Sierra Club and would later become the statewide president of the, of the, of the uh, Sierra Club. Uh, I was approached by several people in the university community to run for the Davis City Council. I hadn't been very active in the city, uh, uh, and it was kind of a mystery uh, as to why they sought me out. So after thinking about it for several days, I decided to throw my hat, hat in the ring, joining uh, the others in a two-way race. Uh, I, didn't, I certainly didn't uh, fit the mold of the others who had ran uh, had run in the 50s and 60s, and when word got out that I was going to run, one of the former Davis mayors, uh, this being Harry Whitcomb, uh, and one of the downtown gang called me that flaming liberal. <laughs> well, I'm gonna try, I told him, I said, I'm gonna try to prove that to be correct, so. <laughs> As it turns out, when the uh, bike lanes came before the city council, uh, more about this later on, Harry Whitcomb, was the only person in the audience to protest making, putting the bike lanes on 8th Street, on 8th Street. Uh, and we had to take away the parking to make the bicycle lanes work. Uh, the parking had to go. But, uh, and he, uh, he had property on 8th Street, uh, and so more about that later. So I formed a campaign committee of those people who were courageous enough to encouraged for me to run for the city council. Most were political neophytes, including myself. Just to show how na naive I was, I said, well, somebody said, you, be you, get you better develop a platform. And I said, well, what's a platform? <laughs> something you walk on? <laughs> you know, <clears throat> it's those things you stand for and changes that need to be made. And as we brainstormed, we came up with uh, a number of, number of issues, uh, such as, uh, the Richards Boulevard, uh, safety issues on Richards Boulevard, well, we, we still still have that, but uh, best pedestrians and bicyclists were unsafe going through the, uh, underneath the railroad trestle. Child care was a, was a concern, and aside from DPNS, there were a few options that people felt had, and people felt they had the, the, the need for coordinated child care services. A member of the community had mentioned to me uh, that you couldn't buy wine in town. Uh, you could buy cooking wine, salted wine at Safeway, and uh, wanted me to do something about that. Uh, that uh, Norm Woodbury, who was, of course, a public power advocate, uh, you know, we could buy out PG&E and have our own power. Yeah. Now, and uh, people were concerned about smoking in the public. And so we got around to do something about that uh, down the road. The environmentalists, of which uh, Kent Gill was uh, at that time, this the school district had given up building something or selling this particular lot here. We called it in those days, remember, the Arden Mayfair lot. And, and Central, where we're sitting right now was where the old Central School was. And uh, we thought maybe uh, we ought to do something about that. Uh, well, when we roll those uh, planks out, you can certainly understand why uh, people, Harry Whitman and other people call this group the Flaming Liberals. Uh, once my candidacy became official, people sought me out for issues. I received a telephone call from Frank Child, 
then a professor of economics and his wife, uh, Eve, Dale, and Donna Lott, who wanted to meet with uh, Norm and myself regarding bicycle lanes. And I said, well, what are bicycle lanes? <laughs> well, Norm couldn't make it. <clears throat> and uh, so I went and listened to their, their pleas uh, <clears throat> uh, that the city should initiate a program to uh, install bike lanes, bike paths in, in town. Well, I soon found out that these folks and others had been advocating uh, bicycle safety programs in the city for a number of years. This wasn't uh, something new to them, uh, but it never appeared on the agenda to the best of my knowledge. The uh, Childs and the Lots had taken sabbatical leaves in Europe and had learned about bicycle lanes there. They asked for my support, and I said I was happy to join in the crusade, uh, adding to the other liberal causes. Uh, I must confess that I had an ulterior motive. I say this in jest, uh, that the mark of a smart politician is to steal somebody else's idea and make those people think it was yours. <laughs> so I put it on the platform. So did Norm Woodbury, and we campaigned in part on bicycle lanes. Bicycle lanes. Somebody came up with the idea of putting posters on bicycles. And here, here we have the official campaign chariot of 1966. <laughs> uh, where's Mr. Bowen? That's. This is for your, your museum. <laughs> we'll keep this around. Do any of the original posters still exist? I'll get to that. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Lo and behold, Woodbury and I were elected, and uh, what happened uh, uh, with all those campaign promises, uh, more about that later, but uh, I think it was in the fall of 66 here. You know, I'm glad Dave Pels is here, but he, he can correct me in terms of these dates and uh, my faulty memory. But I placed the uh, bicycle lanes on the uh, Davis City Council agenda for discusses, discussion purposes, not knowing exactly how it would proceed. A lively debate transpired uh, among the, a split city council. It was immediately evident that two other members of the council, this uh, uh, Gene McChesney, I think his first name was Gene, and Ralph Aronson were in opposition. And we were looking, uh, the three of us, I, I had Norm's vote and I was pretty sure of, uh, of uh, Kent Grill's vote. We were looking at the public works staff, Dave Pills, uh, Fred Kendall, and uh, Dwayne Copley for some guidance. We were talking about the installation of bicycle lanes as, I, as, as has been pointed out, and not only in California, but possibly in the United States at that time. It didn't appear that we had a resolution, and my frustration level was rising, and I recall and I read that, and I was quoted in one of the newspapers as saying, we're gonna stay here, do you remember this day? Remember, we're gonna stay here until midnight, if it takes that long to get these bicycle lanes, lanes approved. So during the course of those discussions, I was looking at Dave, and I was looking at uh, Fred and uh, Dwayne Copley uh, to give me some wisdom. Uh, now remember, Dave and Fred and uh, Dwayne were very good students. They were engineers. They received their degrees in civil engineering. And, and uh, they didn't take any classes in what you would call classic Highway Construction 101 or Building Bicycle Lanes 102. They were mostly concerned about automobiles in the, uh, in the schools of, uh, of uh, engineering, civil engineering in those days. But also they were very good, they were very good uh, mathematicians, you know, in higher mathematics and the only thing a civil engineer needs to know when he goes into uh, uh, goes to work for cities is the ability to count. The ability to count to three. That's a council minority. That's higher mathematics. <laughs> 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 so 
So, so as we scrambled around up there, why uh, staff came to our came to our our, our uh, uh, came to our uh, what's the word I'm thinking of? Uh, what? Rescue. Hmm? Rescue. Yes, that's right. <laughs> came to our uh, rescue, and uh, they were the ones I that suggested. Well, let's do three experimental bicycle lanes. Three bicycle experimental lanes. Uh, now bear in mind, I, I knew that I had two votes. <clears throat> Norm and I were on, on, on uh, record, and, uh, uh, but Kent, we figured that he would, he would come along, and as time wore on, uh, uh, we wanted to go with this. And so I called for the question about the installation of uh, three experimental bicycle lanes that had passed, uh, three to two. Then there came the, cost, uh, the question of cost. Uh, that's probably where Ralph and, and uh, Gene were balking on it, but my, my memory serves me, and Dave can correct me maybe here, I think we appropriated the, the uh, noble sum of $700 for striping and for, and, uh, for signage. And uh, <clears throat> I do remember that we had uh, one lane uh, on uh, Sycamore, Sycamore and Russell, and uh, that turned out to not work so well. And, uh, here again, I'm glad that Dave is here, we cracked it, because they had separated, one of the experimental ideas was to separate the lane from the road and separate from the sidewalk, and they had some cement, long, elongated cement blocks in there. <clears throat> and of course, bicycle, uh, automobiles still had the right to get in to park. The beauty of the bicycle lanes, of course, in addition to slowing the bicycle, having bicycles, was to slow those cars as they came in and looking for parking parking places. Uh, one, of the, one of the problems with the bicycle lanes early on, why particularly on foggy nights, we'd have people driving in those thinking that they were uh, a, 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 a automobile lane. <laughs> well, they weren't. And so I, think, I don't think those lasted very long. So uh, uh, where are the others? Why maybe Dave, you can, uh, you can uh, deal with that. Uh, and uh, parents, uh, in a short period of time, my parents had came to me, came to me and talked to me, and they were very supportive of the bicycle lanes. Not so much because of energy concerns at that time, but safety. It was mostly safety, but because once they got into the bicycle lane, my cars tended, for the most part, to slow down, and uh, we were off and running. It was a complete success uh, within five or six months. Uh, <clears throat> Little did we know at that time that the uh, California Vehicle Code uh, prohibited uh, cities from doing certain things in terms of striping and signage. And so uh, Jim Calloway, the city attorney, brought it to our touch and said, you, you can't stripe those out there without uh, getting permission for it, you know. And, and uh, so as I call, we, we contacted our local representative. They had adopted, adopt, introduced a... Uh, a resolution of the state legislature that would allow cities then to uh, to stripe uh, and uh, signage for signage for bicycle lanes. So <clears throat> later on, uh, the city went on to us to um, put in the uh, first and maybe the only still bicycle light on Russell and uh, Sycamore, where you have just the bicycle as all in four way four way stop. Uh, here again, the legislature had to approve that light, as I recall. And uh, now, what, what I've told you here this afternoon, I wouldn't swear to on a stack of Bibles, uh, but I think it's pretty close. Uh, some, of, some people have claimed that they invented bicycle lands. Well, we know who was responsible for pushing the city, as I mentioned, the Charles and Lots and the public works staff that I've mentioned here, for expanding the bicycle lanes. I think we have, what, 200 miles of bicycle lanes and paths now. But once again, Dave can, can correct this, and it's, it's all, <clears throat> it was included in the general plan very shortly, and every development then could, became, that came before the, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> um, the city council, uh, the, the developers that have to, to uh, provide uh, uh, bicycle lanes. And so, here again, <clears throat> fast forward to 1992, when I decided to run for city council again. And once you steal a good idea, why throw it away? 
Now, here's, <laughs> here's, here's my son, Matthew, on the right, me, of course. And so we did, we did the, uh, I guess you'd call them posters in the, in the uh, bicycle spokes in uh, 19, 19, 19, 19, yeah, it was not, I ran in 88, but I did this in 1992. The reason we know it's 92, because he, he's of a certain age, so. <laughs> Another one for you. <clears throat> Now, back to some of those previous items that I mentioned in the uh, campaign planks. Uh, you know, I lost the battle to uh, widen Richards Boulevard and to install bicycle lanes uh, two or three times, but eventually we did compromise by putting, through the, putting the tube through for the bicycle tube and the pedestrian tube, and uh, uh, <clears throat> we need to do something about that because it's in a state of disrepair and they don't, uh, we're not taking good care of that tube and we're not taking care of the lights and a few other things, so. As for the smoking ordinance, a subsequent city council en enacted the first smoking control ordinance in the, in, the city, in the state of California. I mentioned about buying out PG&E. In those days, we had student interns, and so I had an econ major at the university study this, and uh, this was, <clears throat> and uh, um, his name was Dwight McClurdy, and as it turns out, he learned so much about PG&E and their property and the inventories and their rate structure and all that that he, be, he became the chief rate setter for the state of Alaska. Uh, <laughs> this job turned into a great job for him. So, Well, we could have done that. Uh, we figured out that we could have bought out PG&E and become a public, uh, public, uh, public power, but the, but the uh, public will wasn't there. But then, if you fast forward again into the 90s, another group came forward and tried to uh, uh, get it going that the city then would, uh, would buy out PG&E as a few other cities in the state of California have done. So, As for childcare, uh, we talked about that and eventually the uh, city took a very active uh, leadership role and developing uh, small child care facilities. These are uh, uh, private facilities for the most part, small cooperatives, and uh, eventually ended up with Donita Stomgren. Some of you remember her. She was the coordinator, not only for the city, but for Yolo County in terms of child care facilities. As for the sale of wine and spirits, uh, the city at that time was subject to a three mile limitation because of the university. Uh, this limitation was opposed in 1912, and uh, none of the other university campuses bothered to worry about it, only Davis did. And, uh, and so uh, <clears throat> we went to the legislature and asked that they remove that limitation, which they did, but they said, well, you're gonna have to live with, without any more wine for four years, and so eventually came in, and that's when Ellen Am and Jakes that were out on the, out on, uh, out on the highway they moved in, moved into town, did, as did others. So, and in terms of open space, the vacant lot was something of interest to Kent Yell. This one right here became uh, a, a factor in another campaign that I got involved with. Uh, another bunch of liberal, flaming liberals uh, helped me with that one in the city, extended Central Park, and uh, led to the establishment of the Bicycle Hall of Fame, where we are sitting right now. Uh, in closing, the, some people have asked me what the, <coughs> what the most difficult job, if uh, Mr. Bowen will help me, the most difficult job of being a uh, city council, particularly being mayor, just spread those out, would you? And, and could you give those over those? The most difficult job is getting on and off the high wheeler. <laughs> and I was circulating some of the, uh, some for you to share with, with one another. I enjoyed writing it, but it's, it's tough, I'll tell you. Uh, just in closing, totally in closing now, in preparation for the 50th anniversary, which is five years away, uh, I think we need a landmark, a significant expression of the importance of bicycles in Davis. Uh, maybe some historic plaques, you know, they're going around and putting plaques around historical spots in the city of Davis where the first bicycle lanes were. Maybe that's something. Uh, 
maybe in our new water tank out in East Davis, the one that's been painted with pastels, we could put a nice big bicycle on top of that. <laughs> so those are some ideas for you to think about. You've all been very active in bicycle program. Maybe you can come up with something that would be significant that we could work on over the course of the next five years or so. Thank you very much. <laughs> Well, that, uh, that was certainly a, a nice trip down memory lane. I appreciate the, the, uh, the way you worked that through. Um, there are just a few hiccups along the way. Uh, <coughs> the, uh, yeah, right. Have to do that. Um, I guess the first thing is to make it clear that when the bike lanes were instituted in the city of Davis, I was not the public works director. Uh, however, Dwayne and I were on the city staff at that time and were given certain assignments, but the, uh, the actual uh, heavy lifting was done by Fred Kendall, who was the public works director, along with Art Eichhorn, who was uh, pretty much uh, been around uh, enough to, uh, to provide a lot of help in that regard. So um, we, we need to make that very clear that Dwayne and I, as a for instance, uh, kind of uh, took over the, what was going on from a bicycle perspective and, um, when, uh, when I became public works director in 1972. So there was a few years there where uh, biking or bicycling in Davis was, uh, again, under the direction of the public works department, but uh, my personal involvement was minimal at that point. So. Thought I'd make that clear. What else was it you were saying? That was, uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> I, I, th <clears throat> I thought it would be a, a good idea to um, kind of uh, go through a little bit of the the history that took pl or that the items that took place um, after 72 because uh, there was a lot going on that wasn't in the city of Davis, but the city of Davis did have a lot to do with. Um, the, um, for instance, um, right about 1972, uh, there was a report that was done for the university and for the city of Davis. It was a combined uh, uh, study done by Duluth Cather, which really was the first time that we had, we were able to put down into hard copy all of the details and the standards that um, were uh, developed in the previous years. And, Duluth Cather not only looked at historical facts, but they went, uh, uh, went over to Europe and borrowed a lot of information that had been developed in Europe by that time and incorporated some ideas that uh, were implemented both in the city and in the university. And I don't know, David, when did you come along in... Uh, Eighty-seven. I was in. I was in grad school in Davis in the early seventies, so I did see some of the. I remember the uh, the bike lane on Fifth and Right, right. So um, David Takamoto Wirtz, um, since he's been uh, in his p position on campus, has been a valuable. Uh, person, resource person, and uh, someone who, who really knows um, what it's like to handle 20 or 30,000 bikes all moving at the same time around campus. In fact, I think it was the traffic circles that Duluth Cater came up with that actually finally got those intersections organized. Uh, Big improvement, although it took a long time for bicycles to really figure out how to do it. 
Yeah. Okay, I'm not so sure they have yet. <laughs> <laughs> but if that doesn't prove it's not important. Right, right. Delu Kather, it was two two words, two last names, combination. Dan Smith was the engineer who actually did most of the work. Lou Weiss on campus came from, uh, I think, the uh, planning side, planning and engineering side of the university. Uh, and uh, while we're talking about it, the uh, lanes on the what do we call that? I guess it was type two bike lane, Dwayne. I can't re can't remember, but Let's see, class. class, yeah. Ah. At any rate, the that that's the reason I'm mentioning it now is because that design where you have bumper blocks out at what now is at the bike lane line and cars parking outside of that and leaving a space, I think it was 10 foot, inside between the curb and the parked car. And that, but that concept has, has you know, even after these many years has not disappeared, there are still people who think that might be a good idea and they want to try it. And, it, and when I was active, I've, I've been retired now for almost 12 years, and when I was active, that um, design usually ended up over at the California Bicycle Advisory Committee, which was a committee that advises uh, Caltrans on standards. And the, the person that uh, was uh, responsible or in charge of that uh, committee, the bicycle, California Bicycle Advisory Committee was Rick Blunden. Rick lives here in Davis and in his way has contributed a lot to what has gone on in Davis in, in very positive ways. Uh, Rick's long retired like, like I have been, but uh, I don't know if he is continuing to get in inquiries about that as now that he's a retiree, uh, Caltrans being a very large organization, I doubt that, but not, you know, later, not more than a year ago, um, I get a letter from somebody who's asking about those bike lanes that are against the curb and what information do I have to help them decide whether they're going to use that or not. Well, I've packaged up information that's, you know, in, been formulated in consultant reports and pack, send it off to whoever's making the inquiry, hopefully discouraging them from trying anything like that. The um, the track that I just I wanted to uh, to continue on uh, has to do with uh, more more people that were involved in in the work that um, that has been done over the years. Uh, there was a, um, an, an effort, obviously, that was necessary once we had established that bike lanes were a legitimate part of the transportation system were well, changes in the vehicle code which would uh, uh, m you know, modify s and clarify a lot of the uh, changes that had been taken, that had took pla taken place. And uh, um, there's a city attorney, Bill Owen, at that time, who served on that committee that eventually came up with this yeah, go ahead. Move any way you want. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, uh, I guess it's uh, SCR 47. It was a, was a bill that required that to be done. So Bill Owen, again, representing the city of Davis, 
was there to work on that, uh, and he, he came on board, obviously, because of the city's involvement in the League of California Cities. A lot of these studies that took place over in, at the Caltrans level were staffed, and then volunteers from different organizations were named to that uh, uh, group. And uh, because the city of Davis was a member of the League of California Cities, we had people on those committees representing the League of California Cities. Uh, I served on the uh, California Bicycle Advisory Committee for a, a number of years um, with, and this was again staffed by Rick, Rick Blunden. The, uh, there was continued refinement and questions of uh, things that needed answers uh, that were, uh, uh, were dealt with at CBAC and uh, the people who, who have, um, were, were helpful in terms of the work being done to look at standards and decide what was appropriate and what wasn't appropriate. Um, we had to do that. We had volunteer people from the community, uh, some people associated with the university where they might have some grant funds, but uh, Dale and Donna Lott uh, were uh, um, among those who, uh, who who helped us. Bob Summer, another person who when time, when it was needed, uh, we, we, generally you, you have to understand that as these standards became more refined uh, when people were trying more things, um, the, the, the folks who were um, opposed to those, uh, particularly um, people uh, that were uh, like John Forrester, who is well known in the, uh, a lot of uh, bike organizations, uh, he would write, uh, write as to why he was opposed to it, and um, John uh, would, uh, uh, or Bob, excuse me, Bob Summer would take on the job of writing back and deciding, you know, trying to help uh, make Forrester see the light that uh, these were uh, unnecessary changes. So that relationship and that those um, uh, kinds of things went back and forth over the years. Um, there's a uh, talk with people about the the, the need for more uh, information out there, and Dwayne and I co-authored a a paper back in, uh, I think it was 1995, that was done uh, for the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers, uh, where the, uh, the paper was presented at a conference, a transportation conference down in San Diego. That document, this one that Duane and I came up with, um, pretty much is a concentration of how we got to where we, we are in the uh, design and, and the uh, promulgation of things that related to bicycles out on the public street system. So uh, I guess I, I'm try, I've been trying to just skip over some of this history and uh, outline what, what I perceive to be areas that haven't gotten an, enough play because what we're talking about is um, a lot of folks participating at various levels in, the organ, in, uh, uh, in, in this program to make the bicycle a form of transportation as well as a uh, vehicle that can be used for recreation. Um, so 
I think I'll leave it at that, and maybe we can get to more solid information. Uh, Where were the other two? The other two left to go. Experimental. Oh, experimental? Yeah. You put in three experimental lanes. Uh, Sycamore, and then there were two, two other. Oh. Yeah, the question is, uh, I thought we put in three experimental lanes, one at Sycamore, and there were two others. Was it 8th Street and some of the others? Do you remember where those were? Uh, 14th was one where we did the same thing that we did on Sycamore. It was a more residential, you know, less trafficked area. Yeah, there was no, as I recall, no overnight parking on that section of 3rd Street from L into campus. And uh, I, rem I remember using that route and thinking, hey, this is not a bad idea because you, know, you had the full width, both the parking part and the bike lane part to ride your bike in an area when there was a lot of vehicles or a lot of uh, bikes headed for campus. Dave, do you want to take some questions in? Sure. Dave? When did the Russell White House get developed? The question. When did the Russell Bike Path get developed is the question. Are uh, you talking about in conjunction with the Russell Boulevard reconstruction that we did? Towards winters, yeah, yeah. That was when Stonegate was being built, and I don't remember. Seventy four, maybe. Who is Howard Reese? Who is Howard Reese? Howard Reese is, was the uh, city manager for the city. Um, he was a city manager when I took the job as director for the Public Works Department. Um, and I think he was probably, what, eight or nine, maybe 10 years city manager. He, he came, Howard Reese came to the city in 1966. The, the reason I remember this is because the previous city manager, as soon as I was elected, uh, what was it, Burko, Burko? Burkolo? Burkolo, Walt. previous city manager, Burkolo, he resigned. <laughs> but furthermore, it's an interesting thing, then when I ran again in 88, the existing city manager resigned again. <laughs> and that's, that's what, <laughs> What about Harris? Who about Harris? I'm tough. I'm tough on city managers. <laughs> Any other questions? Hi, I have a question. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a civil engineering professor, and so I get into little details. So, I, two things that I, I can't put together. One is that Davis is known as the place that bike lanes got started. And the other is that Davis has nice wide bike lanes, seven foot wide often, six foot sometimes, but often seven feet wide. And yet, nowhere in any national standard have I ever seen seven feet for a bike lane. Five feet became the standard for a bike lane. So if bike lanes got started here in Davis, and, and you learned that it's nice to make them seven feet wide, why didn't anybody else learn? I, I don't I think they started out, the, the, the standard originally established, we had uh, 50 foot between curbs to work with, and uh, we painted two vehicle lanes 
11 foot each. And then we allowed for eight foot on each side of the street for parking. And that leaves you six foot for a bike lane. One of the DK, yeah. I got a question for Mayor. Uh, Mr. Skinner, when you were going through your campaign years or uh, months, did you ever uh, host group rides around Davis with you know potential followers for the for your campaign? Uh, the question is: Is during the campaign did I participate in or organize group rides around the city of Davis? That you know. <clears throat> People thought I was nuts anyway, crazy. <laughs> driving around, driving around town, riding around town with my the bicycle, with these in, in between the spokes, you know. And and the only thing that I really organized uh, walks was a, a professor at the university, a rhetoric professor. He said, if you'll have somebody make a sandwich board, you know, in the old days they had sandwich boards. You'd walk around a board in front, board in back. That's before the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's a member of the audience. So before the internet, that's right. <laughs> and so, in addition, to the, we'd have our own family would ride around on the bicycles. By then, we'd also walk around downtown on Saturdays and Sundays with this guy with the one sandwich board. <laughs> Question back here. The other question is deals with the uh, 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 Frank and Eve Child and Dale and Donna Lott. What was their motive and and uh, other factors associated with uh, their initiating uh, the bicycle land uh, the quest for bicycle lands? Uh, <clears throat> they had been at this for a couple of years. Uh, they uh, had been in uh, sabbaticals as I in, in, in Europe, as I indicated. And for some reason or other, they became obsessed with this idea that Davis should be more like some of these European communities. And I think some of you, some of you have seen them, you know, where, uh, <clears throat> in fact, not just European, but if you go to China, <laughs> you'll see real, a lot of real bicycle lanes over there. And they had accumulated a lot of information about bicycle lanes, pictures and things like that. I was overwhelmed with their knowledge on this particular subject. I thought, I thought, <clears throat> well, when we're developing my platform, well, just put here, put here, it doesn't matter. People don't care, you know, they're, they're gonna vote for this or whatever. They're. And, and uh, we convinced, we became convinced that that with, because of their sincerity, you know, uh, Norm Woodbury was, was part of this as well. And of course, Norm brought more credibility to, that, uh, to the city council race than I did because he'd been on the city council before, he had a previous mayor. And so then when Norm starts talking about bicycle lanes, why well, then people responded more favorably than they did to this flaming liberal that just moved to town. <laughs> David, another question? Uh, yeah, you know, whenever I hear about the, the establishment of the first bike lane in Davis, it sounds like the process of getting approval for the state uh, through Department of Transportation and legislation on that, it seemed like that went fairly quickly and smoothly. I contrast that with our experience working together on the bicycle single head project, which seemed to me to be a, a much
much less radical concept of bike lanes back in the mid 60s. Um, but of course, by the 90s, you've got the California Traffic Control Devices Committee and all that. Can, can you just comment briefly on sort of comparing and contrasting the difficulty or ease of working under those two different systems from the, you know, the 60s <coughs> to the 90s? And do you feel that the, the current system, which does involve a lot more bureaucracy and levels of approval, is that uh, does that question need to be repeated? <laughs> Just answer it. <laughs> well, you're right that there is, uh, there was a big difference. And uh, I don't know whether you could say that uh, one was more complicated as much as uh, one was much more politically influenced or, you know, influenced by politics, basically. Um, the um, the one that Helen the the bill that uh, Helen Thompson was carrying through uh, um, the process over there got vetoed after what we thought was a lot of really good work, uh, and it was defeated. I think not because of the merits of the bicycle design piece related, but the fact that it was packed with some other um, issues that the governor thought would make a mandate for local agencies to be able to get paid by the state for that. And so uh, we were the victim of the first time, victim of that. Dave, follow up too. When Maynard's talking about the city council coming up with these first ideas, was there any resentment in public works about, you know, we weren't hired to do this, this is something new, why are they asking us to do this? Or was it all gung ho, jump in, let's do this and create a, a new system? Well, it's hard to say what, how excited people got about the idea, but I, th I think it's important to note that when the city council says this is what we want, um, you all of a sudden become the people who need to think about how you implement what the council wants. You don't think much about the fact that this is a dumb idea. It's called political engineering. We have some great people in the audience, and just so people in the, in the camera land out there know, we have a uh, former assistant Director uh, to Public Works, Dwayne Copley, is in the audience. And next to him is uh, Helen Poole, longtime owner of B&L Bike Shop uh, and a uh, longtime supporter of the Davis Bike Club. In fact, for many years, that's where you went to find the Davis Bike Club. So we appreciate you uh, visiting with us today. Um, and so do we have any other further questions for our panel there, right here? Uh, yeah, and there was some discussion and some changes made, as I recall, uh, uh, during that process. Uh, correctly, I think Maynard mentioned that the bike lane, originally the bike lanes had a, a, cl a clear reflector spaced about maybe every 100 feet along the bike lane line. And that was suggested by the police chief as being something necessary to uh, enhance the fact that people could see that this bike lane was something special. And this was in addition to, uh, I'm trying to remember, what the, the original message was bike lane as opposed to Oh, you're talking about signage on, yeah, on post, on a post. I was thinking of the... Uh, yeah, on the street. On the street. No, there was a post. Yeah, there was posts, but then there was the markings on the street. Those were the white signs with the blue outline of a bicycle, right. Does anybody have any of those, by the way? We want one for a display. Uh, 
Uh, actually, that you know, that's an interesting point. There's, uh, there's like, I don't know the exact numbers these days, but back when I was still active, there were like 4,000 miles of freeway in California. A thousand of those miles were open for bicycle travel. And Davis now, I uh, correct Maynard a little bit, is we have over 50 miles of bike lanes and another 50 miles of uh, separated bike paths. So we have over 100 miles of dedicated bike yeah, ways. I don't think we're to 200 yet, but we're, we're getting there. We had another question back there? Yeah, John. I was curious about Maynard's profession. What, uh, the question is, uh, what, brought me to, uh, what brought me to uh, Davis and to the University of California at Davis? And, uh, <laughs> That's a good question. A lot of people know that one. Would like to know the answer to that one. Yeah. <laughs> Those were the good old days in the 60s, you know, when the university was really hiring. And uh, I had finished my doctorate work at the University of Colorado and became very interested in international education. And uh, so the University uh, Davis was looking for a foreign student advisor it was growing very rapidly, uh, student affairs and, and the academic departments. And, and uh, so uh, there were a number of people that were doing a lot of different kinds of jobs that they decided, well, this, because the university at that time was adding a thousand students, thousand students a year, that's when they started hiring people in student affairs uh, to uh, provide assistance to Various subgroups, and in this case, international students. Uh, w at that time, we had a number of international students, uh, primarily in agriculture, uh, as we still do. And in fact, the university now, strange as it may seem, is going out recruiting international students because they can pay the freight that we poor Americans cannot do, okay? Did you end up as a vice chancellor? Assistant vice chancellor of student affairs. And, um, I have something I'd like to lay out for the audience, just as a matter of uh, principle, I guess you might say. Um, after I retired, maybe a couple of years or so, um, I wrote a letter to the editors, and I can't even remember the subject of, of the letter, but it was about bikes. And I use the terms b bicycle driver as opposed to bicycle rider. And I did that very specifically because a very wise man, uh, Vic Mentink, who is a retired policeman, a, a chief of, of the police, lives here in Davis still. He suggested that that better gives you an image of what we're doing with bicycles as a mode of transportation. And if you think about it, bike riding, maybe you ride if you are, what, riding along a pathway, or there I use the term, on a bicycle, and it's a, you know, a fun thing that you're doing, and you're riding with other folks. Um, but the word bike driver uh, says that the person that's operating this motor, this uh, bicycle, is a driver in all sense of the vehicle code, as is a driver of a car. And it seems to me that we could maybe change some thinking if we start using that on a regular basis. That that the bicycle is really a mode of transportation as much as or more than it is a, a vehicle of uh, recreation. Does that make sense? The, the reason I'm asking this is because it really, what, um, what, what uh, Debbie Davis did, she, she sent me, I, I complained about the fact that she had changed in my letter, <laughs> bike driver to, to bike rider, and I wrote her back an email and said, hey, wait a minute, some, somebody edited these out. And she says, yeah, it was me. Uh, and I, I did not think our readers would understand what that meant. I said, okay. <laughs> here, here, here we are, next to the, what, smartest <laughs> people in the world around here at this university. Any, any rate, so... Um, 
I'm, I'm just mentioning this as an, as an example of something that one little thing maybe can help people uh, better understand why we have what we have here in Davis as it relates to bicycles. So, so for what it's worth. Any other questions? Right here. Yeah, uh, I have a question for, for you, later. When the, the first push for bicycle lanes came, was, was a concern about children a big part of it, or was it mostly a concern about adults, college students? Uh, or so that's the main thing. So how have children factored in, or have they not factored in much? Yeah, the question pertains to the uh, early days of the, and were the uh, concerns uh, for children Primarily, or part of it, yeah. Um, of course, the uh, the Childs and the, and the Lots were the were the experts on on, on this, and uh, uh, that was during the course of those those discussions. Why uh, the answer, quick answer, to your question is yes, uh, very much so, in terms of uh, safety for children as they bike bike to school, and uh, and. Uh, later on, when we, uh, we the city, we in the United States, had the, one of the first big energy energy crunches, as I recall, it happened in the 80s, or uh, when they started withholding oil for the Middle East. I think that we had a, where, <laughs> as strange as it may seem now, you know, where the price of oil, uh, price of gasoline went from 60 cents to a buck fifty, and everybody really complained about it. <laughs> it, it uh, Safety seemed to be the primary factor as opposed to energy. Uh, we did get into energy, of course, uh, in, in, the, in the 80s, but we're, now we're talking in the late 60s and the late 70s, 70s, and so it was uh, reinforced by <coughs> comments that we heard from, from parents that, uh, that, of course, as they expanded the bicycle lanes, why uh, uh, more and more children could access, uh, access them. Okay, we're going to wrap this up now. Um, we appreciate all you guys coming. We have an announcement from the current bike and pedestrian coordinator from UC Davis, Dave Takamoto Words. Thank you, Bob. Actually, it's not so much an announcement, but um, Dave mentioned the Delu and Kather report. Um, and just want to let you know that there's a fellow by the name of John Allen, who's a very well known bicycling advocate and educator, uh, lives back in uh, Massachusetts. And he's had a website for years and years and years. Well, a number of years, he's been to Davis several times. Um, and he's collected basically as many documents about Davis bicycling as he can and put them on his website, uh, including a, we, I provided him a scan of the Dulucather report. Um, and there's just a lot of other information, uh, including a you know, link to Ted Bueller's uh, study and all that. So if you can, I don't know the website offhand, but it's John Allen, bike expert, um, and if you Google, you know, Davis, California papers or whatever, and you, you can track it down if you can't find it. Oh, the A-L-L-E-N, typical spelling of John Allen. So it's a really good resource if you want to find out some more about some of the stuff. Thanks. So in five years, uh, we'll have a huge uh, celebration of the 50th anniversary. I'm sure we'll all be around there. Uh, so let's plan something outrageous and memorable, and uh, that'll set the, the standards for the next 50 years. So we appreciate uh, Dave Peltz and Maynard Skinner coming out and joining us today. <laughs> And, and we thank you both for all of your support and, and vision because as we've learned in, in anything, uh, nothing's ever easy and somebody has to be the flaming liberal or to take the, uh, uh, okay, <laughs> to get out on the thin ice first. Yeah, I've, I've been involved in a lot of policy decisions at Davis Company, but this was one of the easiest ones. <laughs> there was one person in the audience that objected to this whole thing. <laughs> Today, there'd be a thousand maybe, who knows, <laughs> but it really slid right on through, and credit, a lot of credit goes to people in the public works that, that made it work. That's great. And so we can't take anything for granted, and I know those of you in the audience know that, so uh, not only have you guys uh, laid the groundwork, but hopefully uh, we'll continue to build on, uh, stand on the shoulders of what you guys did. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming today. Bye-bye. <laughs>